Everybody warm enough? Yeah, I'll warm. get that turned off. <laughs> um, so get a feel for the audience. So how many dairy producers here? Anybody not a dairy producer? Okay. And those in the back, what? <coughs> okay. Okay. So we got the NRCS crew in the back row. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> Nicole asked uh, if I would come up and, and talk a little bit about some of the feeding work we've been doing over the last decade and how it may tie in with um, profit. Um, obviously, everybody's interested in that, but also stewardship. So this is kind of a polling question. So those of your producers here, if you had a uh, chance to make 10 cents more per cow per day, how willing would you be? Somewhat willing or really willing? So somewhat willing or really willing to make a change? Okay. How about 20 cents a cow a day? Okay, okay, so a little more excitement there. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk to you about today, the studies we've done are in that range. So, um, and they've been done on uh, commercial dairies. Well, most of the studies have been on commercial dairies, so they're on farms like yours. So, <clears throat> so anyway, let's just go ahead and get moving into that. So we're, we're gonna talk primarily in the first part about nitrogen. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about phosphorus. And then at the end, we'll talk about um, uh, an NRCS program that is available, uh, hopefully during this next year, where you may be able to get some uh, equip funding, environmental quality uh, incentive program, and uh, be able to uh, get some dollars to help with some of these feeding changes. And speaking of changes, <clears throat> it doesn't seem to want to go from slide one to two. So, I'm not sure what we're going with going on here. Somebody want to get the phone? Um, okay, so I'm not sure what the hang up is here. But anyhow, so today I'm going to provide an overview of the importance of feed management and its relation to whole farm management. So. In relationship to feeding our cows, how does that impact everything at the whole farm? I'm going to share a few examples of how feed management can reduce the import of nitrogen to the farm and uh, increase profit because to me it makes no sense to ask you to do something if you aren't going to end up uh, at least being cost neutral but preferably making some money out of it. And then what are some of the environmental implications and incentives? So we kind of think of this cow manure or homegrown feeds triangle that we're all trying to do our best to manage. Um, <clears throat> feed management or precision feeding, which is what I'm going to talk about today, kind of comes in here between uh, the cow and the manure, but obviously the manure is connected to homegrown feeds and those come back to the cow as well. But if we do a better job of targeting protein requirements for the cow and get our phosphorus levels down in the diet as, as low as we can and feed multiple rations, there's lots of things we can do, um, then we should be able to uh, minimize the amount of, uh, of nutrients or, or nitrogen in this case. It's going in manure and therefore kind of help this uh, balance of things at the whole farm level. One of the projects we've worked a bit over the last uh, six to eight years is a, a process um, that captures phosphorus from the liquid dairy manure in the form of struvite, so it's like a dirty sand material. Uh, that's what it looks like for the granular. and. Um, so it's looking like that's getting pretty good adoption. Um, you're going to see some farms adopt that, that uh, particular technology. And so hopefully the cost on that will come down and um, we'll give a chance to capture some of my phosphorus. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, the selection of forage type on the farm and the acreage can impact the uh, need for import, imported nutrients. So uh, in other words, if you've got 500 cows and 100 acres or versus 500 cows and 1,000 acres, that's going to have a huge impact on you know, how much of uh, imported feeds that you're going to need to uh, consider in terms of grains and, and hay and other things that are imported off farm. So it kind of all ties back to feed management again. So as a result of precision feeding, um, and um, I th we think uh, that we've we'll demonstrated you can do a better job um, with the precision feeding, then we can reduce the imported nutrients to the, to the farm. 
So it just lessens the challenge of trying to get the farm in some sort of balance. So, um, dairy producer, yes? Okay. So, um, this is a diagram that those of you remember Dave Grusenmeyer was here some maybe 20 years ago now. Anybody remember Dave? Okay. Saw him during his last year. He's in New York, doing well. Uh, remembers uh, his, his years here and um, continues to talk fondly about them. He's still involved with the dairy industry back there, uh, primarily now financial programs um, and uh, to, to support the uh, dairy industry there in New York. So yeah, they developed this diagram looking at, <clears throat> okay, if you think about the, the farm boundary, you got feeds coming in, fertilizer, and bedding. So those would be a lot of your primary nutrients coming into the farm. And then, <clears throat> of course, the primary export is going to be milk. But we have uh, bull calves and some cow call, uh, call cows, and then in some cases people are selling crops. But increasingly, if we're going to try to get these farms in some sort of nutrient balance, and that is nitrogen in, nitrogen out, or phosphorus in, phosphorus out, we're going to have to think about exporting um, some of the manure. And um, so again, whether that be as compost or some of these uh, forms of, of uh, struvite uh, phosphorus in, in the form of struvite that's captured and exported off farm. We're gonna we're gonna need to look at that. <clears throat> so if you consider the cow and what happens with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, um, again we'll focus mainly on nitrogen, phosphorus today. About 20% of the nitrogen is used for maintenance. About 13% of phosphorus is used for maintenance. In a case of potassium, it's about the same as phosphorus, about 12%. Um, on a lot of typical diets. Uh, average kind of diets, and cows here in the Northwest aren't average, so we do a little better than this, but um, across the United States, you see about 20% of the nitrogen that goes in the front end of the cow gets captured in the milk carton. So 80% is going someplace else, and we know 20% is going for maintenance, so that means there's about 60% of it <clears throat> goes into manure. So what can we do to improve that? So what we'd really like to do <clears throat> is get more of it going here and less of it going into the manure. So let's go on out in the urine and feces. So um, what we're going to do talk, talk about today is how can we get this to the point where we're actually above 30 percent. So how can we get more of what the cow eats in the form of nitrogen out in the milk carton <clears throat> or in the milk truck and less of it in the manure and do, and do it in a way that's going to be more profitable. So just one more diagram to look at. If we were to adopt different practices on the farms. This might be nutrient management plans, um, it might be forage production practices, um, and then we look at the scale on, on the y-axis here going from excess nutrients to deficit. We want to keep progressively moving ourselves up the scale, keep adopting things which are going to be economical. And, and one of them that we're going to talk about today is the shift that was seen from in the old days <clears throat> of feeding cows just for crude protein, while we consider that as a, an indicator, what we're really trying to do is feed um, the bugs in the cow's rumen, the bacteria, so we want ruminally <clears throat> degraded protein, but then we want some of the protein to bypass the rumen to go on to the lower digestive tract for the cow to digest. And so that's moved us into this area of actually um, looking at specific amino acids, and the two that we'll talk about today are methionine and lysine. And they're uh, commonly available um, through, you know, via your nutritionists and your feed dealers. Um, there's a number of sources of, of methionine as well as lysine that are out there uh, to be purchased. <clears throat> so again, try to take this food protein in. It gets broken down and uh, forms ammonia and other nitrogen compounds that then drive my microbial protein production. And we'd like to see about, um, <clears throat> if we could, maybe as much as 60% of the nitrogen getting get used this way. And then some of the undergraded nitrogen then goes on into the abomasum, as well as this microbial protein. Of course, the abomasum is just like our stomach, and that was uh, where you get the acid production and the breakdown of these proteins then. And then the amino acids go into the lower digestive tract where they're absorbed. So <clears throat> on any given farm, then if we want to think again about increased adoption of practices, in this case we're going to talk about feed management practices, we focus on nitrogen. So what we want to do is 
we want to move up the scale of practices which will move us from a point of being excess nutrients to one of being in some balance for any given farm. So certainly we want to balance for crude protein, that's a really good indicator for us. And we want to balance for this degradable intake and undegradable, so that's uh, the degradable being feeding the bugs, and then this is um, bypass protein that goes down to the lower digestive tract. We want to balance for metabolizable protein, and then move into this area of uh, amino acids, specific amino acids, and how can they complement these. And then there's lots of other feed additives like yeast and um, probiotics and so forth that can also have um, additive effects on uh, productivity on the farm. So on any given farm, you know, we start adapting, adopting these practices, we might get to here, and that, that farm might actually be in a, in a nitrogen balance where other farms might have to adopt even more practices to try to help them get into a, a better balance on, on nitrogen utilization. So let's talk about some of the feeding trials we've done. <clears throat> and again, what we're trying to do is take this true protein um, that's there in the diet, and we want about 40% of that to bypass, go into the lower digestive tract, and we want the amino acid profile of this protein to be uh, nearly identical to milk, milk protein amino acid profiles. So whenever um, companies and nutritionists look at trying to formulate these ratios, what they're trying to do is they take into consideration the, the amino acid profile of milk protein and they try to get proteins which might be blood, um, might be distiller's grains, soybean meal, uh, canola meal, any of these sources, and they want it to match and bypass as best as possible then the lower digestive tract. Um, so it will be the same kind of amino acid profile. And then as they feed the degradable or non-protein nitrogen fractions, which go to ammonia, and um, <clears throat> uh, then are taken by the bacteria to produce bacterial protein, they want to drive this as much as they can with not only the non-protein nitrogen sources, but also starch availability, sugars, um, in some case, also, um, uh, the addition of fat becomes very important for, for energy requirement of the cow as well. So, <clears throat> once we have this all in balance and, and um, get all these things to the right ratios, then we can get the maximum uh, productivity of the cow. And, <clears throat> again, what we're trying to do is get the majority of this absorbed into the blood and less of it down here in the feces or excreted back, in this case, to urine. The other thing I'd point out is anytime we feed excess non-protein nitrogens, those uh, are captured via ammonia absorption, and then the kidneys have to work to get that excess nitrogen out. And that comes as a cost to the cow. Um, so there's an energy cost there for, for her to, to excrete that out in the urine. So anything we can do there is a better energy efficiency for the cow as well. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, um, we looked at two different diets. Uh, the first diet was a general herd diet. It was what this particular commercial herd was feeding already. Uh, for those of you who know Jim and Nanny Workhoven, it was the Workhoven herd. Um, and then we, we went in and we reformulated the general herd diet to have less protein in it. So if we can do a better job of targeting the actual protein and nitrogen and amino acid requirements, we ought to be able to move the level of protein in the diet down so we don't have to import so much to the farm. And uh, the source, in this case, of methionine we used was a product called Alamet. The source of lysine we used was lysine hydrochloride. And this is the same sort of lysine that's uh, fed to swine and poultry. Uh, there's products now that are what are called bypass sources of lysine, but uh, Ten years ago or so when we ran a study, those weren't readily available. So we used lysine hydrochloride. And then the particular protein source that we used, which was a bypass protein, is called soy pass. So it's a, it's a protected um, soybean meal. So, um, and so the soy pass is a vegetable-based source uh, rather than um, like blood, meat or, blood meal or fish meal, which would be an animal uh, protein source. Then the methionine, as I mentioned, is a, is a, a compound called Alamet. If you're interested, that's what the long name of it is. Um, I won't pronounce that. And it's produced by Novus. And again, lysine was in the form of uh, lysine hydrochloride. So these are all things that can be bought uh, regularly and have been available for 10 or 15 years. 
uh, commercially. We used a particular ration balancing program. Ration balancing program. It's called CPM, and the reason we used this one was because it allows us to get all the way down to looking at balancing for these uh, levels of methionine and lysine. So what we wanted to do in this particular study is we wanted to target to be at 88 percent, just under, or 110 percent, just over the methionine requirement, and then we wanted to be just barely under on lysine and just barely over on, uh, on lysine, so about 97 percent, 108 percent. And so it's not only the amount of lysine, but it's the ratio between lysine and methionine that becomes very important as well. And I'll show you a, a study that we conducted that if you get those balance, those two amino acids out of, out of whack whenever you're formulating these diets, it actually can have a negative impact on the cow. So it's really important whenever you're looking into these uh, more precise diets or, uh, that, uh, that you, you really know what's going on with both the methionine and lysine. And then here's a metabolizable protein that was there predicted um, about, um, or about a pound a day and about two-thirds of a pound per day shy on metabolizable protein. So in other words, the cows were in a situation where you would hope that they would respond <coughs> to the methionine and lysine. So how much are we feeding? So um, <coughs> lysine hydrochloride, so 33 grams. So um, gosh, what's in the sugar packet? How many grams? Probably 10. So, what do you think? Sugar pack got 10 grams in it, Nicole? I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you have in Carbohydrate? No, how many grams of is actually in it? Five. Five grams of whatever? Okay. In a sugar packet? Oh, I'm sorry, the entire thing, four ounces, 113 grams in sugar packet. 113 grams. So you can see that we're not adding very much of this. And so the question becomes, you know, sugar packet, how can I, I mean, is, that, is that pounds of milk a day? It actually it is for the dairy cow. And the same thing with Alamance. So we aren't feeding very much of these things. So, um, okay, so what did the diet look like? Give you an idea. Did we come up with something that's abnormal that just doesn't look like anything you've ever fed? Well, no. Get alfalfa hay, corn silage, grain, uh, corn grain flake, the corn distiller, beef pulp pellets, molasses, energy too is a fat source, soybean meal, bakery waste, bakery mix, soy pass, it's a soybean meal, mineral vitamin mix, and then mineral vitamin mix that had these uh, two amino acids. <coughs> so anything there that you guys haven't either fed or seen somebody feed? So it's pretty normal stuff for Western Washington in respective amounts there. Okay, so what did we see in terms of being able to reduce these diets? Well, we went from a diet which, which was pretty reasonable in, in protein, it was just shy of 18, and we were able to drop it basically a point, so just under 17. So we went down uh, about one percentage unit of crude protein. Dry matter intakes were fairly similar. Uh, these are group feed intakes, which so couldn't do any statistics on them, but if anything, these cows ate slightly less on the reduced diet. Milk, 99, so right at 100, 101.9, so two pounds of milk. Protein, 290, 293, so we actually got more milk, a little more protein as a percent. So our milk protein pounds went from 288 to 295, so we're doing, we're capturing more nitrogen. It's going in the front end, we're capturing more of it in milk. And if you look at the ratio, which will give us that, an idea of the, the capture, Look at the ratio of milk true protein to feed protein. We're just under. So we were pushing about 32% capture of nitrogen uh, or protein coming in the front end of that cow that's going out in, uh, in milk truck. So, how do we do on uh, looking at nitrogen? So our nitrogen intakes, because of the reduced crude protein diet, we were able to get a reduction of 7.4% uh, change. Uh, milk total nitrogen went up, again, because of the increased milk, plus a, a slight increase in milk, fat, or, excuse me, milk protein percentage. The predicted urinary nitrogen uh, went down by about, uh, what's that, 50 grams, so that's about 17% reduction. 
and then uh, calculated fecal nitrogen went down by uh, about 10 grams, which is about 5%. So we're, we're feeding less of what we fed, we're capturing more, and because of that, we've got less going out in the manure and in the urine. Okay, economics. So this was uh, 2001, so I guess we're going on 12 years ago now. So this was prices of, of that day, actual feed costs and actual um, milk check uh, component pricing and so forth for, uh, through Dairy Gold um, at that point in time. So feed costs was uh, 482, so who, who would like 482 feed costs today? That'd be great, right? But again, anyhow, what we're looking at is relative right here, so you got to multiply that by two for today. But, uh, so experimental diet cost us about uh, another six cents. But at that time, the milk income was 11.92. Yeah, and, and again, this is dollars per day, not not per hundred weight. And then uh, milk income here, because we had more milk, we had better components. Uh, it was 12.10. So our income over feed cost was 7.22 versus 7.10. So we got 12 cents out of this one. So that's why I asked at the beginning, anybody willing to want to make 10 cents? Well. That's what happened in this particular case. Okay, and that, that's where we had, so we had two diets, commercial herd, and we really did a good job of controlling these lysine to methionine ratios. Okay, so what can happen when you muck that up? You get this lysine methionine ratio goofed up. So this study was run at the Knott Dairy Center in Pullman, and we had, in this case, three diets. So we had one, again, it was above 18.6. In this case, we were able to, to drive it down to about 16 with different protein sources. And I think, uh, in addition, this was back in 2001, too. So, you know, I'm going to kind of resurrect some of this from the memory. But I think we forced a lot of corn silage in on this, too, which helped us get <clears throat> the protein down. Typically, the herd there, because of proximity in the flus, feeds a lot of uh, alfalfa hay and alfalfa silage. So their, their NDFs were fairly similar. If anything, this diet three was maybe a little bit higher. Soluble proteins, fairly similar, um, and then soluble crude protein is a percent of the total, so we're in here in this 34 to about 40 percent range. And then the non-carbohydrates, which would be kind of your starches and sugars, are right in here in the low 30s. <clears throat> and in this case, we again used lysine hydrochloride. We used the alumet that we previously had talked about as a methionine source. And then the special protein source in this case is prolac, which is a... Um, an animal marine blend, so it's a, a blood meal, uh, non-bovine blood meal, and um, and fish meal uh, with some other ingredients in it. So, a, a pretty reliable source. We've we've had really good luck with it in trials that we've done. So, again, we want to look at you know anytime you're trying to figure out are you at requirement or not, you don't want to overfeed or you want to feed some cows under that requirement and so forth. So, on the on diet one, we had lysine about 89%, diet two was 99, and then diet three, we went above. <clears throat> Methionine was 91, 116, and 109. So you'd think these two diets are at or above on lysine and methionine, so we ought to do a pretty good job. These, these cows ought to perform better than this diet. <coughs> this ratio of, of being about 3.3 is, is kind of critical on this lysine to methionine. We want it in this 3.2, 3.3 range. Anytime we get down to below three, in this case it was down to 2.9, you, you can potentially run into problems, and we'll show you how that played out in this particular study. Again, here we were pushing about 3.2, so these were up about where we wanted them, and so what happened is here um, we kind of got a little bit of inversion here in terms of slicing the finding ratio, and, and as a result it shows up there, and then the uh, metabolizable protein balance was um, slightly negative in each case. Again, we wanted these cows to be in a nitrogen challenged state um, as we tried to do this study. So, um, <clears throat> this was a longer duration study than the one that I showed you from Workovens. That one was uh, a couple of three week periods, of about six weeks in length. This one was, uh, was a, uh, a longer duration, it began in early lactation, it kind of went out a few months. These cows were, were eating a bit less, they're in about 45 pounds of dry matter intake, no differences. Milk was uh, 79, 78, and 82.5. Um, not significant differences, but we obviously saw this greater amount of milk here. Milk fats um, were essentially the same on the first and third diet. Let's see what happens with fat test when we get that lysine methionine ratio uh, goofed up. 
uh, we get a, a drop <coughs> test, and we also have this issue with um, milk going down. And then um, on down here, we can see that if we look at crude protein intake with this uh, second, third diet, we're able to do a pretty good job of getting the crude proteins down. But again, this the second diet, because of the uh, mix up on the, uh, the ratio of lysine methionine, we did not get as good a, a response out of those cows. So when we looked at the reduction in crude protein imports, even though these cows didn't do quite as well, we had them down to about 16% crude protein diet. The reduction in crude protein imports uh, to their diet would have been 8.6 in both cases. And then when we get down to the income over feed costs, really, really get to tell the story. So again, that higher protein diet um, produced less profit. <clears throat> And when we got the lysine methionine ratio goofed up, we, we lost some money over if we'd have never done anything to begin with. And then we're back up making more money uh, by about, well, in this case, 35 cents a cow a day. So, um, and we've done a few others of these studies. We just finished up one um, this last month at Workhoven's again. Um, two groups of high producing cows actually had about 175 cows per group on it. Um, similar kinds of changes in terms of lysine and methionine and, and uh, good protein source per lac. And uh, we got early calculations indicate we're about four pounds of milk. And um, I got to get a few more dry matters and a few more things done yet and, and, and look at the, the, the last of the economic calculations with um, the actual component pricing and so forth. But we're somewhere in the 20 cents a cow a day on that study as well. So we're ranging 10, 20, in this case, um, about 30, 35 cents a cow per day. So um, from these studies that we've done here in the Northwest, and one of the reasons we, we started doing these about 10, 12 years ago was that there had been a lot of work done in Wisconsin or on the East Coast. And they tended to be in diets dissimilar from what we feed, a lot of corn soybean diets. And we feed a lot of other things out here. So we wanted to see how this kind of an approach would work here in the Northwest with the diversified feeds we have. But in addition, we wanted to see what had happened with cows that produced 90, 100, 110 pounds a day. And, um, and it's playing out that we can see those responses. So it gives us some confidence that it's not only the lower producing cows that might have been involved in some of these other studies in the Midwest and the East Coast, but also high producing cows here in the Northwest. So I think targeted use of protected protein sources uh, in combination with these methionine lysine um, materials that are out there can improve profitability, but we're also going to have a situation where they're more environmentally friendly because we are not putting out as much nitrogen into the urine and feces. So, so I'm going to shift into the, pro uh, into the phosphorus side of things, so I'm going to take a brief uh, moment here to give you a chance to ask any questions on this or I can even back up and go to some of the questions and slides. So any, any questions at this point about kind of this whole protein, amino acid, nitrogen side of things? Yeah. The last slide that you had. Yep. Uh, your MUNs there, that's the number that I see every day. Yep. That 18.8, that sends up a red flag. Yep. And and that was high because that was the that was the control diet. So that diet is this diet that we didn't do any made no particular effort to try to do anything with to make it a particularly good diet. And so when we improved the nitrogen profile side of things, you're right, we got that MUN down. So these would be levels we would prefer to have, but even as a single indicator. If um, if you weren't also looking at milk and income over feed costs, it, it, you know, it, you got to look at multiple things, right? <laughs> and we use it as an indicator. And really, what what we're doing there with that milky urea nitrogen, uh, collectively, what that tells us is um, <coughs> how good a job we are doing with providing the rumen bacteria with enough ammonia, but not too much and we're providing them enough fermentable carbohydrates, so enough starch and sugars. So that they can take these starch and sugars and that ammonia and then make it into bacterial protein. So if we, if we aren't doing a good job of providing the right amount and the right um, rate of availability on the nitrogen side and the starch side, 
then we end up with excess ammonia, which will show up then as mercury and nitrogen. Because what it does is this excess ammonia goes in, gets into the blood, and then it ends up in uh, absorbed in the blood, and then it ends up in the milk part because because the levels of uh, blood urea and nitrogen are fairly parallel to what's in milk urea and nitrogen. So, so a couple ways that can happen: you can either have too much soluble protein um, amount or rate of availability, or you can have a mismatch of the, the starch. So let's say you had um, a corn silage which was had gotten really uh, very mature in the fall, really hard kernels, which we don't tend to see, but uh, if you had that and it wasn't processed, it was not processed corn silage, and so that starch just isn't available, readily available to these bacteria to capture that ammonia, then you might have uh, your, your solubility and your rate might be okay here, but your carbohydrate side's not matched up very well. So that's what that MUN is doing, is it's indicating how good a job we're matching up both the energy and the, the nitrogen side. Other questions on this protein nitrogen side? Okay. Now we're going to talk about phosphorus. Um, so it's in, this will be more brief. Um, and so, how many of you are beginning to have to do phosphorus indexes or phosphorus? Pay attention to phosphorus on your soil tests and working on nutrient management plans. Anybody? Couple in the back. Okay. So, um, so what's going on with um, with phosphorus? Well, the issue with phosphorus is if we get too much of it. Um, and again, let's uh, let's put this in perspective again. So, uh, let's go back here to. Okay, so go back to our cow figure. So now we're talking about this middle cow where she's using 13% of the phosphorus for maintenance, 27% is going into the milk carton, and 60% is going into urine and feces. And it primarily goes into the feces because very little of the phosphorus in a cow goes into the urine. So um, it's primarily with that, the fecal matter. Um, so. Here with the, the nitrogen, we were wanting to get this above 30%. There's a lot of things we can do. It's, it's a lot more difficult uh, on, the, on the phosphorus side um, other than just to try to keep your phosphorus feeding as low as you can possibly keep it and, and still meet the requirements. Um, and some of these bypass protein sources and, and byproduct feeds we feed uh, tend to have more phosphorus in them like distiller's grains. So you want to feed them because they're low cost, but just also be aware that they, uh, the phosphorus is going along for the ride. So um, in the Chesapeake Bay region, phosphorus is creating a big issue for uh, impaired water and, and a variety of other places. Here in our part of the US, um, we're ending up with issues in the uh, um, Puget Sound. Um, and obviously you don't dump any Puget Sound here, but even some of the coastal water are dealing with phosphorus enriched water, which when there's the right level of phosphorus and nitrogen there can create some problems with algal blooms and, and, and issues. Um, I haven't heard anything in particular as if tied to directly any shellfish like bacteria are, but, um, but still you get the green scum um, and you get aquatic growth and, and then when that stuff dies off you get low oxygen. So. I guess indirectly through low oxygen when you get into those issues. This map was created on a county by county basis. Uh, it's probably 10, 15 years old now maybe. It was created um, by a group at the national level. And what they did was they looked at <coughs> ag statistics and they said that for the amount of crop land that's available in every county and then the amount of manure phosphorus that would be produced how close are these different counties to being in balance? So, to being in balance. Um, so the, the either the redder or the bluer it gets, there's an imbalance. It means there's more phosphorus that's coming out of the manure than the crops can take up. So again, you see all this Chesapeake Bay area. 
you see some of these other high concentrated areas where there's um, corn and soybean production and animals. And so as it relates to phosphorus, so what's happening? Well, um, what I've learned is that, that in the United States, one of the primary phosphorus mines is down here in Florida. So a lot of the phosphorus we get and use today as commercial fertilizer and so forth is probably coming out of Florida. But the other thing is it's also coming out of Florida and going for corn production. So we're taking phosphorus in <coughs> Florida, shipping it to the Midwest, growing corn. And then that gets shipped out to the East Coast, to the Southwest, to the Northwest, and um, in the case of beef cattle in here in the, in the central part of the U.S. And so we begin to see that we've got this movement of phosphorus all the way from the very southeast to across the U.S. US. And, and we aren't, so for instance, we aren't doing anything to connect the phosphorus that's coming out here to our cows. Like I said, we've got, what, 60% of it's going in the manure. If we don't need it for a crop growth, what can we do to get it back to where these crops are growing? So that's what we've been working on the last half a dozen years. The other thing that's come about is there's, there's a group worldwide, and in fact, it's quite active in Europe. They're trying to get good estimates on how much phosphorus is actually available to be mined, and, and where is it, and, and um, how easy is it to mine it. And so over the last couple of years, there have been some estimates made that the availability of phosphorus reserves might be as short as a few decades. So it's kind of this idea of how long can we drill for oil? Well, it's how long can we mine for, for phosphorus? And so they suggest that the supply of mined phosphorus is running out and it might be as short as 30 to 40 years. And that's probably the easily mineable phosphorus. So where is it? Well, nearly 90% <clears throat> of the world's estimated phosphorus reserves are found in five countries. Morocco, China, South Africa, Jordan, and the United States. And um, with the largest amount is actually uh, found in, in Morocco. So what happened if something happened to the control of Morocco where they all of a sudden decided they really wanted a lot of money for the phosphorus? What could we do? So it could be a real geopolitical uh, issue with that much control of phosphorus by, uh, by one country. And in fact, I was talking to um, our maintenance guy at our research center a couple years ago when they replaced all the fluorescent bulbs in our buildings. And uh, they went to a new high intensity, lower uh, energy cost bulbs. And as a part of that, he said, boy, the, the price in one year went way up on the bulbs. And he said that uh, a lot of it tied back to because they have so much phosphorus in them. And the phosphorus prices have got jacked up you know, from these different sources around the world. So <clears throat> everything OK? Yeah. OK. So I've been trying to create some awareness about it that um, we got that 60% coming out of the back end of the cow. If we don't need all of it, let's try to get as smart as we can to capture it because uh, you know, in the next couple of decades, it may be that it's a, a source of money for us as well, um, even more than it is right now for, for crop production. So, so about 10 years ago, I, I put together some numbers, gave this talk up here, so some of you may have seen it already, but <clears throat> related to phosphorus. So what was the Whatcom County view of reality as related to phosphorus? So in 2002, which is when I did these numbers, the average milk production at that time was about 22,753 pounds per cow. There were about 62,000 cows up here. So anybody got a feel for whether these are kind of on target anymore? I haven't looked at any recent numbers, but that's what they were then. Um, the content of phosphorus in milk is about 0.09%. I said the cows ate about 52 pounds of dry matter intake, and I just stayed with the lactating cows. I said that the phosphorus in the feed was about 4.4%. So that meant in any given year with the feeds that were eaten by those cows, whether it was off farm or on farm, it was 2,362 tons of phosphorus seed. Then if you look at how much gets exported in milk, there was 637 tons of phosphorus exported in milk. So, um, Question? yeah. Uh, 2,300 tons eaten, is that all imported or is that coming out of some of our own grass? It's, it's combination. Okay. It's a combination. So yeah. <clears throat> so we're not importing the difference here. 
Um, no, no. So <clears throat> the difference is what's coming from homegrown. But hang on a second, that's good. If you're paying attention, then that's good. <laughs> and that's going to help everybody else too. So <clears throat> you had 2,362 tons eaten. This amount exported. This is the amount that's uh, at that time I um, I'm working with the conservation district. New was about 44,425 acres available to you guys to apply manure. So using some standard numbers of what the phosphorus content of grass is, what it is of corn and so forth. That meant that it was about 1,724 tons of a positive pea balance. In other words, there was more phosphorus there in the feed, regardless of whether it came from off-farm or on-farm, to put back on the crops than was was needed. So, looked like beginning to build a bit of a, a bank account, fairly substantial bank account for phosphorus. So then went on to say, okay, if you had kind of the typical, so that's about 77 pounds per acre. So then what I did was I said, okay, um, if I take kind of the standard values of phosphorus and corn and grass and so forth and say that there's a certain distribution across the county, how many more acres would it take to get all that phosphorus used. There's another 44,000 acres. So you guys got a lot of phosphorus. So I think um, anything you can do to think about innovative ways of capturing it in the next couple of decades, I think is going to be to your advantage, um, particularly financially, because I, I think that, um, yeah, they'll probably find a few more reserves, but they're going to be more expensive to, to dig or un, un, uh, unearth. And I think this phosphorus is going to become, um, you know, a bit of a gold nugget for you. So, any more questions on the phosphorus side? Okay. So I made money, but now I depressed you by saying this phosphorus thing, and I apologize for that. But that's that's the life. Okay. So then I thought, I'd swing it back and say, okay, NRCS, the guys in the back row, particularly center back row, are anxious to give you some money. And Nicole said I need to spend most of my time talking about the first two thirds, which I did, and not spend as much time talking about this. So, um, so that's what I'm doing. But uh, there are locations in the United States, in particular um, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, Wisconsin, and California, who have uh, put programs together through NRCS and through their EQIP funds through a practice standard called feed management where they have provided substantial dollars to dairy producers to change the way they're feeding their cows uh, to minimize nitrogen intake and to get better utilization of phosphorus. So they actually pay, depending on how the incentive programs work, they either pay per cow, they pay per group of cow, um, and it requires doing some monitoring like you know, what are your TMRs, um, in some cases uh, having those analyzed, but also maybe following milk, um, milk production milk nitrogen export from the farm, which is pretty easy to calculate. You've got those numbers already all the time. You just need to multiply a couple of them together. Um, and um, so there's other folks around the U.S. that, that are, uh, so you have a nutrient management practice standard, right? That everybody's 590. Everybody's heard of 590? That's your nutrient management practice standard. That is the core basis for your nutrient management plants that you have on the farm. There's lots of other practices which are Mineral management, well, that's just a lagoon, <coughs> land application, and buffers, and all those sorts of things. But the core one is called 590. So the number for the feed management is 592. So about 2005, so now it's going about eight years ago, we realized as a group of us that work in this kind of feeding <coughs> nutrient management area that NRCS had this practice standard, but they didn't have all the tools in place to implement it. So we submitted a grant to them and we got them to fund eight land-grant universities to put together the infrastructure so that they could, in a logical way, um, implement this practice with uh, beef, dairy, swine, and poultry across the U.S. And at that time, and pretty much still now, there's less than probably about five people in all of the NRCS staff across the whole United States that have any animal background, particularly any animal nutrition background. So they were glad to fund it. So we had um, Texas, California, uh, Purdue, 
uh, Nebraska, Washington, um, Missouri, and a couple more. So there was, there was eight states. And so we, we put together the infrastructure for this. So that's what I'm going to overview now is what, what we did during that time. So the definition of feed management, it's to manage the quantity of available nutrients fed to livestock and poultry, so just put in here dairy, for their intended purpose. Okay, so that's, that's the basic definition of this practice standard. So the purpose then of it is to supply what's needed for maintenance, production, performance, and reproduction while reducing the quantity of those nutrients excreted in the manure by minimize overfeeding. So all those things I talked about in the front two thirds of the top, <clears throat> so which you're already doing to some degree, um, and also improving net farm income through efficient feeding. So, and I showed you in each of the cases I showed you that we, we, we made the changes, they were more, more environmentally friendly, but there was more money in your pocket as well. So, one of the things we did then was put together a, a five-step process for feed management to be adopted um, on farms. So the first one is to determine the purpose. Um, on any given farm, is there the potential for, how much potential is there for changes in the feeding to actually impact things at the whole farm level? Can you substantially decrease nitrogen excretion and will that um, have a big enough effect on your farm? <clears throat> and the same thing with phosphorus. So kind of go in and do some initial screening. Um, and then identify the conditions where the practice applies and, and assess the opportunity. So we developed an opportunity checklist. So this checklist would be used by, by the producer and in this case conservation district or NRCS. In our state it typically is, is conservation districts. Um, could be that your nutritionist works with you on this particular piece step as well. <clears throat> so you go through, look at all these different things that could impact um, nutrient balance on your farm that are feed related and you just go down through and check all those and then if there's enough of them that are checked that it looks like there's an opportunity then you go on to additional steps make sure there's best professional judgment it looks like making some of these changes are economical and then you actually develop the feed management plan so this is the point where the nutritionist gets involved they come out we have a checklist and a template for them to gather all the information that's needed to write the feed management plan and then uh, implement that. So in this case, we might determine that the purpose is to, to uh, more efficiently capture nitrogen and have that less of a potential environmental issue. The conditions would be that um, you know, you're feeding for crude protein level now, but it looks like feeding a, a better bypass protein source um, and looking at methionine and lysine might be good things to do. And the nutrition <coughs> says from looking at research has been done, plus their analysis with their computer program, it looks like, yeah, there's a pretty good chance it's going to make you some money. Then they go in, put all those steps together, what is it they need to change on the farm, um, what kind of monitoring needs to be done, and so forth, and then the implementation, you actually start implementing it, and then following up with either milk sampling, um, uh, feed sampling, uh, manure sampling, whatever it is that the group here in Washington decides or what needs to be looked at to um, verify that, that it's actually been um, implemented. So <clears throat> the key players then, again, as we look at adopting the speed management 592 is you want to get into the, the development of the plan, the implementation of it, you do some monitoring, again, that's going to involve some sampling analysis as well as some record keeping. So <clears throat> early on here, you want to get your consulting nutritionist involved, and in particular, they're going to be involved with doing the on-farm assessment uh, to provide the basis. So you want to get them involved pretty early on here. NRCS, in particular, they'll be involved here at the very beginning, but as time goes along, they'll probably then tend to step back until it gets towards the end where you get the implementation again and the money uh, would start to flow. So, um, so that's kind of how the, the players and, and the steps are involved. So again, just kind of capturing both of those here. Um, so you got to determine the purpose, who is it? It's usually your nutrient management planner and the producer. So that would be like a Chris Clark or whoever else is, is doing those. Then the next thing is identify the conditions and the opportunities. What are the things on the farm that could be changed? 
again, that's usually a nutrient management planner and producer, but also typically begin to involve your nutritionist. Economic evaluation, definitely going to have the nutritionist advisor involved at this point because you want to be making, um, adopting practices which are going to make money. And then if the feed management plan development, the nutritionist and the producer are definitely going to be the ones that know what's going on uh, with regard to these two pieces and, and be involved in writing that. And then implementing and monitoring to so be a nutritionist producer. So in these other states, the way that they've used, utilized the equipped funds, they've used them to, not, to, to pay the nutritionist to actually write the plan. And that varies depending on the state, whatever they figure is, is the right. So your nutritionist can, can get some income. Um, I mean, he's not gonna get rich, but it still pays for his time to be involved in writing one of these plans with you. And then there's dollars that come to the producer because of implementing it and showing that that practice actually uh, made some changes on the farm. So um, so that that's what I know is out there and available. Um, the state that's having the greatest success with it is Pennsylvania. Um, they've got a lot of dairies that are signed on to this. They've written uh, a few hundred nature man or feed management plans, excuse me. And uh, they continue to do a lot of training and, and keeping the nutritionist certified and, and um, NRCS has really bought into it in that state. Um, they're really fortunate that one of their top <coughs> guys there in the, that region has got uh, nutrition and, and has really pushed the, the practice. And they're, you know, they got the whole Chesapeake Bay thing where it's really getting pushed. And so they're continuing to look for voluntary ways of making change and also getting, uh, getting the, the producers uh, uh, rewarded for it economically. So, what else, Nicole? Questions. Chuck. Uh, one question on the protein feeding. Yep. Talk about income, about feed costs. Yep. But you're going to have other costs involved too. I mean, it just seems like the expensive cost of feeding, you know, these high protein diets. There's a negative know. cost. Yeah, negative cost. I mean, that's what I mean. I, I, and that negative, so many barriers. And that negative cost is associated with, um, as I mentioned early on, the cow has to do something with all that excess nitrogen. And the organ in her body that's going to um, get dinged by that is the, is the kidneys and the liver. And so the kidneys and the liver have to expend more energy to deal with that. And there are certain computer programs that will actually predict the milk loss from that. But how it plays out is, with those high protein diets, you won't see it as a productive an animal because they're having to take some of their energy. So that's, economically, that's where it plays out. Are there other health liabilities, potentially? Um, well, if, if one of the cases is you've got high nitrate issues, uh, and it's not only high, high protein, but one of the reasons that you have high, well, see, when you run crude protein uh, and have your, have your forage analyzed for protein, nitrate doesn't show up in that analysis. So if you nitrate adjust it, you might have a forage that's, let's say you got a forage that's 22% protein, which is pretty high. It could also have even more nitrogen in it from nitrate that doesn't get picked up by standard Keldahl method. So it depends on what the, what the method is that they're testing. So high nitrates, I mean, they obviously are gonna create some problems for cows. High nitrogen forages create, um, more of a challenge to ensile, and so you have more of a chance, particularly mm -hmm. grass silage, of going clostridial, and um, that can run into some problems, uh, particularly calving with ketosis and other things. So, yeah, there, there's definite health it's, implications. It seems like there's more economic incentives for people to maybe think about wanting to change the protein ratio on the feed. You know, a lot of these, these yeah. other factors yeah. than the 10 cents that uh, might show up on the yeah, but see, I can I can go out and demonstrate that one, mm -hmm. but then you try to go out and run a study where you're trying to show changes in health or reproduction. Now you got tens of thousands of cows, right? And 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 how do you control it? Either you don't. And, and who's no. going to let me go out? I mean, Jim and Andy, uh, right. and for that matter, our our herd in, in Pullman, um, they aren't going to want me to go in there and feed a diet that's going to kill 20% of the cows. So I can show what the economics are. Oh, no, and they 